Welcome to Digging for Truth. I'm Scott Lancer, the Director of Associates for Biblical Research. Today, I have the great privilege of interviewing ABR staff researcher and writer, Brian Windle, concerning the top 10 archeological discoveries related to the Apostle Paul. Brian is the pastor of Island Bible Chapel in beautiful Northern uh, Ontario, Canada, and it's a joy to have this conversation with Brian today. Welcome, Brian. Thanks, Scott. It's great to be back with you on Digging for Truth. That's right. Amen. And uh, Brian, we have a, a great show today because we're going to talk, be talking about the Apostle Paul. But uh, many people don't necessarily realize that there have been a, a number of extraordinary archaeological discoveries related to Paul. And as I always like to remind our viewers, uh, one of our objectives in Digging for Truth is to help people connect uh, what the Bible says. We believe it's God's inspired word and it is true, but it is always helpful, especially for, for seekers, for people who want to connect the dots about the historical background. Today we've got a great show just really connecting the dots regarding the Apostle Paul. Yeah, uh, I love doing um, these little list articles. I, I call them listicles. I, I didn't invent the term. I, I saw it somewhere. And uh, so looking at top 10 lists, top 10 discoveries. And, and I think it's a, a simple way to helpfully show people that, just as you said, uh, Scripture is reliable. And so in looking at the top 10 discoveries related to Paul, um, I realized that there were a lot of things that help us to understand Paul's life better, that affirm and illuminate his life. And so I put together this list, and in order to make the list, um, it needed to be an artifact or it needed to be a place or a person that was related to the Apostle Paul and that either affirmed or illuminated a, um, a, an element of his life that's described either in the, in the book of Acts or, or in his epistles. And so put together this top 10 list. Very good, very good. Well, we're going to cover the, the first two on our list. Number 10 is Roman roads. And, you know, uh, I, I've done a lot of reading about Roman roads and the, rema the remains of those roads, and it's extraordinary. Let's talk about number 10, Roman roads. Yeah, uh, you know, one of the most under appreciated features of the New Testament world were these Roman roads. The Romans went to great expense um, and to great effort to build this massive system of paved roads all throughout their empire, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of miles of them. And uh, for the Romans, it was a way to get their soldiers from one place to the other very quickly throughout the empire. For the Apostle Paul, it was the way that he was able to get through the empire quickly to share the gospel. And the yes. remains of many of these Roman roads, the very roads that Paul would have uh, walked, are, are still to be seen to this day. That's how well the Romans built them. Um, and so, for example, he would have walked the Via Sebest, the imperial road while he was traveling between mm -hmm. Iconium and Pisidian Antioch uh, on his first missionary journey, that the remains of that road are still visible. He would have trod many times, I'm sure, the Via Taurus just north of Tarsus, um, and particularly um, when he went on his second and third missionary journeys and walked up around um, the Mediterranean. The Via Ignatia, the Ignatian Way, was Rome's primary road to the east that ran between uh, Philippi and Neapolis. And we know that Paul would have walked that road um, on one of his missionary journeys. And finally, if you remember when Paul appealed to Caesar, he was taken to Rome, and we're told that that final leg of, of the journey was on the Appian Way, and you can still see parts of it today. And so it's neat to look at these places and to realize the connection there is to the Apostle Paul and his missionary journeys. Yeah, you know, people talk metaphorically about walking in the footsteps of Paul, and in this case, we literally can walk the footsteps of Paul. Very, very exciting. Well, Brian, uh, number nine is the Sergius Paulus inscriptions. And I know you've done a lot of research recently on this subject, and it might be something people are completely unfamiliar with. Um, uh, please tell us about Sergius Paulus. Yeah, Sergius Paulus was the Roman proconsul of Cyprus. 
um, on Paul's first missionary journey, and Paul led him to faith in Christ. That's recorded in the book of Acts chapter 13. And uh, there are numerous inscriptions that have been found, five in total, that have been discovered, which um, which scholars have pointed and said, this might refer to the Sergius Paulus in question. There's a, a Greek inscription right from Cyprus that mentions the proconsul Paulus. There is um, an inscription that's very famous that says L. Sergius Paulus. It's in uh, Pisidian Antioch. There's another one in Pisidian Antioch that names L. Sergius Paulus and his, um, his son. And then there's one that I'm really interested in. It's the Roman Tiber River inscription. And I'm really um, interested in it because um, I'm really interested in this one because it names L. Sergius Paulus and it can be dated to the mid 40s. And that's really important because it was in the mid 40s that L. Sergius or Sergius Paulus was the proconsul of Cyprus. And um, and what's really interesting is one of the other men who is on this inscription went on to become a proconsul in Asia. So it's plausible that Sergius Paulus also went on to become a proconsul. And so I think all of these inscriptions demonstrate that there was indeed a Roman official named Lucius Sergius Paulus in the first century. And a New Testament scholar, Ben Witherington III, concludes, in sum, the inscriptional evidence clearly places Sergi Pauli on the island of Cyprus, and the Latin inscription about Lucius of that family may point us to the man in question. Given what we know about the Roman career patterns of the time, it's quite feasible that the curator of the Tiber River might have before or after his curatorship served as proconsul of Cyprus. So it's a pretty mm. interesting inscription that may point us exactly to the person that the Apostle Paul led to faith in Christ. Amen. And we like to make those connections. They're very, very important. Uh, Brian, uh, one more in our list here. Uh, why don't you go ahead and jump in there with number eight on our top 10 list regarding the Apostle Paul. Sure. Number eight is the Erastus inscription. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote his letter to the Romans while he was in Corinth. At the, and at the end of that epistle, uh, to the Romans, he sends greetings from Erastus, the city treasurer, or the director of public works in the NIV. And the Greek word that's used there is oikonomos, which means the manager or a steward. And it's a general term we think that the Apostle Paul used to describe the job that Erastus did, not necessarily his job title. And, um, and in 1929, an inscription was discovered at Corinth, where Paul wrote the uh, book of Romans from, and it said, uh, Erastus, in return for his edelship, laid the pavement at his own expense. And an edel was someone who functioned as the city's business manager or mm -hmm. um, overseeing the city's buildings and roads and public funds. And here's the thing. Um, this is the only inscription to Erastus yet discovered in uh, Corinth. It dates exactly to the time that the Apostle Paul was in Corinth. And we have other inscriptions that uh, equate Oikonomus and Adel uh, from other places in Asia Minor um, and and in that and in Greece and so mm -hmm. um, it, it just all points to the fact that I believe this is the man who was the Erastus who sent greetings to the church in Rome. Well, that's fantastic, Brian. Well, this is exciting. We're seeing connections in biblical archaeology to the Apostle Paul. We're so glad you've joined us today, and we'll be right back uh, to continue this interview with Brian about archaeology related to the Apostle Paul. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm here today with Pastor Brian Wendell, and uh, Brian and I are talking about uh, archaeological evidence for the Apostle Paul. And we've already covered uh, three of the top 10 list. And Brian, we have to keep moving here because there's so much to talk about today. So let's, let's keep going. We're down to number seven on our list. Uh, Roman officials, the Asiarchs and the Politarchs. 
That's just fun to say. But go <laughs> ahead, Brian. Let's talk about the, those uh, important officials in Rome. Yeah, there were a, a myriad of different um, titles and job descriptions for Roman officials throughout the empire um, and often locally based. And so um, Luke, who traveled with the Apostle Paul, accurately records the names of the officials in the specific locations. Now, at one time, um, terms like politarchs and asiarchs were so rare outside of Scripture that um, that critics said, no, Luke must have gotten it wrong. And as often happens when a critic says the Bible is wrong, just wait a little bit. And there were you know, dis discoveries that were made that proved the good doctor right. So in Thessalonica, we read um, that there were some brothers who were dragged before the city authorities, the politarchs there. And there was an inscription found on the Varder Gate at Thessalonica that begins serving as politarchs, and it lists the politarchs. So here is the politarch inscription, and it, it shows that Luke got the term right there. Um, in Ephesus, Luke mentions that Paul had friends among the Asiarchs of Ephesus, another um, city official. And Asiarch inscriptions have now been found at 40 different sites all around Asia Minor. We now have 106 individual Asiarchs who are specifically named from Ephesus alone, and they date to within 50 years when the Apostle Paul was there. And so we see that, that these inscriptions, the Politarch inscriptions, the Asiarch inscriptions, affirm that Luke knew what he was talking about when he talked about the Roman officials in those particular places. Yeah, you know, Brian, the evidence just keeps piling up from every quarter of biblical archaeology. Uh, these New Testament confirm confirmations, now specifically in this case related to Paul, are extraordinary. Uh, let's talk about one of my favorites, which is the temple warning inscriptions. Uh, why don't you share with us about uh, these important discoveries? Yeah, this one's a really important one because in Acts chapter 21, our, our, uh, our viewers might remember that the Apostle Paul was seized by the Jews in the temple. There was a huge riot from which uh, the Roman soldiers had to come rescue him. And the reason that he was seized was that the Jews mistakenly thought that he had brought Trophimus the Ephesian, a foreigner, into the inner sanctums, into the inner complex of the temple. And Josephus tells us that there was this wall um, around by the court of the Gentiles, which was the farthest place that Gentiles could go. And on that wall, there were these warning signs in Latin and in Greek that warned people who were foreigners or ritually impure not to go further than that point on pain of death. And in 1871, um, one of these particular inscriptions was found, and on it, it says, no foreigner is to enter within the railing and enclosure around the temple. Whoever is caught will be responsible for his subsequent death. And then in 1935, another partial um, inscription of the same thing was found. These white limestone inscriptions, they, they still have some of the, the red paint in the letters on them. And they are vivid reminders of the outrage the Jews mistakenly had when they seized Paul in the temple. And I would also add, they're likely what Paul had in mind when he wrote the letter to the Ephesians, when he talked about the dividing wall of hostility being taken yes. down between Jews and Gentiles. So a really important inscription that helps us understand an event in the uh, life of the Apostle Paul. Yeah, it's amazing how discoveries like this just give a, 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 just a, a little sliver of additional information to help us to actually understand some of the things Paul was writing about in his letters. So it's very, very exciting. All right, let's move on to number five here, Brian. Uh, Mars Hill at Athens. Paul's um, visit to Athens was brief on his second missionary journey, but it certainly was eventful. He, you'll remember that he um, saw the city full of idols and he was really uh, upset by that. And so he started preaching the gospel in the synagogues and in the marketplace. And this led to an invitation to come and speak to the Areopagus. Now the Areopagus, literally that translates Mars Hill. And it appears that that term was used in two different ways. It was, it was used as a, a place name. There actually was a place called Mars Hill. It was this uh, outcropping of rock located about 140 feet below the Acropolis. But it was also, we believe, the meeting place in Paul's day for the Areopagus, the council that governed the city. And so it is likely here 
on Mars Hill that the Apostle Paul made his address, his famous address, to um, the Areopagus, the, these, these people who were governors of the city of Athens at that time. So it's pretty exciting to see a place where Paul might have been. That's right. That's right. Well, if you walk in Paul's footsteps, that rock looks pretty scary. Uh, hopefully he was not only out on the edge of that, but that's an important location for us as we read in the book of Acts. Also, uh, Herod's Praetorium at, uh, at Caesarea Maritima, a uh, very important site in scripture related to Paul. Let's talk about that. Yeah, that was my number four pick, um, Herod's Praetorium. Uh, Paul spent two years imprisoned at Caesarea Maritima under the Roman governors Felix and Festus. And uh, while he was there, Acts 22.35 records that he was held in Herod's Praetorium or in the NIV Herod's Palace. Now, Herod the Great reconstructed the entire um, city of Caesarea Maritima on the site of Strabo's uh, tower, and he named it in honor of Caesar Augustus. But after his death, um, his kingdom was eventually turned into a Roman province, and Caesarea Maritima became an important port for the Roman Empire and the administrative capital in that area for the Romans. And so um, the Roman governor took up residence in Herod's old palace. And the remains of Herod's palace can be seen. Herod built this amazing palace that jutted out into the, um, into the ocean there. And it was square. You can still see the remains of the pool that was there. It was in that palace, either the lower part there or the upper part just behind it, that um, the Apostle Paul would have been held in custody in Caesarea Maritima. Very good, Brian. Well, I, we're covering a lot of ground very quickly today for people, and I just encourage our viewers to open their Bibles, uh, watch the show, open their Bibles, and check these places out. Uh, look at some of this, uh, uh, this amazing, these amazing discoveries related to the Apostle Paul in biblical archaeology. Well, we're so glad you've joined us today, uh, and uh, we'll be right back to continue our conversation with Brian Wendell. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Welcome back to Digging for Truth. So glad you have joined us today. I'm having a conversation today with Brian Wendell. And Brian, we're talking about the uh, most important archaeological discoveries related to the Apostle Paul. And uh, we are moving quickly here, but this is an exciting journey as we have this conversation. We're down to number three on our list, and that is the Great Theater at Ephesus. Let's talk about that. Paul made um, Ephesus the center of his ministry for over two years. And uh, during this time, Scripture records that the gospel just just exploded in that area. In fact, it says in Acts um, chapter 19 that all the residents in Asia heard the word of the Lord. And of course, this then threatened the livelihood of some of the tradespeople in Ephesus who made a living from constructing um, little shrines or little um, uh, statues of the goddess Artemis, who was the primary deity in Ephesus at the time. And that, of course, led to this massive riot that ensued that was incited by Demetrius, the silversmith. And it says that they, they rushed into the theater and for two hours they shouted, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Well, that great theater where that event took place it still dominates the landscape in Ephesus, which is a major tourist attraction today. It is uh, built into the west side of Mount Peon, and uh, it was constructed in, during the Greek era, and uh, renovations began on it in AD 40. So when the Apostle Paul was there a short time after, um, it was still under renovation at the time, but they still used it. And um, it could seat 20,000 people. 
which is pretty amazing. I mean, that's the size of many um, hockey arenas, for example, today, bigger than some of them, in fact. And so tourists today can go to Ephesus and they can stand in that theater and know that that is the actual site of a biblical event, which is pretty exciting. That is exciting, Brian. And I noticed you compared it to a hockey rink. I guess that's very <laughs> appropriate for a Canadian, right? Yep, yeah. Uh, all right, well, our next, uh, uh, our next top 10 uh, discovery, we're down to number two, uh, the Bema Seat of Corinth. Very important discovery. Yes, when Paul was in Corinth um, on his second missionary journey, we're told that the Jews brought charges against him, and he was brought before the proconsul Gallio. Uh, that's in Acts chapter 18, verses 12 to 16. It says, when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the um, Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. Now, if you keep reading the story, uh, Paul was brought before the tribunal. Gallio ruled on the case, drove the Jews away, said, you don't have a case, you don't have a case and he acquitted the apostle Paul. Well, the Greek word that's used there for tribunal is the word bima. Uh, it means judgment seat. And um, this was a speaker's platform where um, public proclamations would have been made, where citizens would have appeared before civic officials. And the Bema at Corinth was actually discovered in 1935. And it was identified as the Bema because there was a Latin inscription that identified it as the Rostra or Rostra, which is the Latin equivalent of a Bema. So we know that this was the Bema of Corinth. It's a large stone speaker's platform. It's seven and a half feet high. It's by the marketplace. And this is the place where Gallio would have sat, where Paul would have been brought before to uh, be judged. And Paul likely remembered that incident when he later wrote to the Corinthians that we will all stand before the judgment seat, the Bema seat of Christ, and we will all be judged one day um, for how we have responded to Christ. So an important an yes. important discovery in Corinth. Absolutely, absolutely. Now the Gallio inscription is our number one um, uh, piece of archeological uh, history connected to the Apostle Paul. Uh, Brian, talk to us about the Gallio inscription, if you would. Sure. Well, carrying on with the same story, Gallio was the proconsul, and archaeological evidence for Gallio, um, the proconsul of Achaia, who tried Paul in Corinth, was actually found at a different site in Delphi, Greece. And it's called the Delphi inscription or the Gallio inscription. It's from the Emperor Claudius, and in it he names his friend and proconsul um, L. Junius Gallio. And what's really interesting about this is this inscription is actually dated. It's dated. It says it's uh, dated to the time that Claudius had been acclaimed imper uh, imperator for the 26th time. And that doesn't make sense to our modern ears, but scholars tell us that that would date it to 51 to 52 AD. And we know from history that proconsuls served one-year terms and um, that they were um, sworn in on a May 1st and they served to April of the following year. And so we know then when the Apostle Paul was in Corinth. This becomes a really important chronological marker that anchors um, the chronology of the Apostle Paul. And from that, we can work forwards and backwards, um, constructing a chronology of his life, and even back into um, the Gospel times and later um, post-New um, post Testament times. And so it's a hugely important um, inscription that helps us date much of the New Testament. And so that's why it's the number one um, choice of our archaeological discoveries that relate to the Apostle Paul. Yes, and so often, Brian, discoveries like that, uh, those anchor points chronologically are very, very important. And of course, we who are looking at biblical history uh, are overjoyed when we find something like this. Well, in our last minute together, uh, Brian, uh, Talk to us about why these discoveries are so important and so meaningful for us. I think these discoveries do a couple of things. Um, they affirm scripture, they illuminate scripture for us, and I think that they show us, I believe they show us, that the um, description of the Apostle Paul's life 
as recorded in the Gospels and his epistles, are accurate. And I think if we can trust what was written about his life, we can also trust that what was recorded about his teachings has also been accurately recorded. Paul mm-hmm. once wrote to the church in Rome that God so showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, that we've been justified by his blood, that we have been saved by him from the wrath of God. And then Paul would go throughout the entire area, he says in Acts 20, 21, teaching everyone, Greeks, Jews, it didn't matter, that we have to turn to God in repentance and put our faith in the Lord Jesus. If if the details of Paul's life are accurate, I believe the teachings of Paul's life are accurate. And this was the good news that drove him, and I believe it's still good news today. Thank you, Brian. It's been good to have you here today. And we thank everyone for joining us on this important episode of Digging for Truth about the life of the Apostle Paul.